Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Welcome to our Green Living Seminar presentation. This uh, semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme of environmental pollution. All presentations are free and open to the public. Take place on Thursdays at 5.30 here in the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, room 121. And as usual, our presentation will last about 45 minutes with an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Quick couple of announcements about upcoming presentations and events. Next Thursday, March 12th, Emma Gildesgame, Environmental Analyst with the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, will give a talk titled, What is New England Doing About Nutrient Pollution in Our Waters? And also, uh, the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition's monthly forum on Tuesday, March 17th, from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Green will be a youth-led forum on climate change. So if you need any more information about those events, come and see me. Today's presentation on mercury in the environment will be given by Zofia Baumann, Assistant Research Professor at the University of Connecticut. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Elena, for inviting me. And thanks for sticking around in the afternoon hours. For those of you who are taking the class for credit, you've got to be here, but I really do appreciate some showing from the community and even seeing some quite a bit of a range in, in age. So uh, welcome to, to the little one too. So I'm a, a marine scientist and I'm really interested in looking at contamination of the ocean. In particular, I've been really interested in looking at metals, which have some kinds of importance in terms of the human health but also they could be toxic, of course, to, to marine life. And so today I will be talking about mercury. This is the metal that I've been most recently studying, and it's a fascinating one. There are so many different things to study about it and know about it, um, and I'll just share with you a little bit of what I have done and share some of the science that some of my colleagues have also been working on. So before I get into the mercury, I just want to let you know about the broader context of our world right now. It's coming to a collapse. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But in uh, 2009, a study was published by Rockström, who's a Swedish scientist, who uh, together with colleagues have kind of assessed the situation of, of the condition of our mother Earth. And looking at uh, the condition of it and, and, and sort of assessing where we're at, they tried to sort of characterize some of the, the risks to the well-being of the planet and our humanity. And uh, what they have done is they have categorized certain, uh, certain really important issues of global significance, looking at things such as ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, nutrient cycles, global freshwater use, change in land use, uh, biodiversity and its loss, atmospheric aerosol loadings, and chemical pollution. And so uh, these have been looked at in terms of quantifying how much of disturbance has been caused by, by, by people and how far are we pushing the boundaries, the planetary boundaries, and how is this relating to our sustain, uh, to sustainability of, of our planet. And it's very, what is apparent is that two of these two issues are not yet, we can't really quite address how are we doing because chemical pollution, for example, has not yet been quantified through rigorous studies to be able to sort of say where we're we at. Are we, are, are we completely screwed up here? Are we, uh, have we polluted completely planet Earth without being able to return back to um, a better situation, and the similar story is here for the aerosol loadings in the atmosphere. So I'm specifically focusing on this little piece of our uh, pizza pie, uh, which is the chemical pollution, okay? And I could not have done my research without the aid of so many different people. These are just some of the few students that I have been working with. This guy here is not a student, as you can imagine. He's my close, collaborate, close collaborator and an expert in mercury biogeochemistry in the ocean. But this is a group that I've been working with collectively together, uh, generating a lot of data and inf new information in the area of mercury cycling. So something about mercury. These pictures will show you how mercury can look like. And you can see that elemental mercury 
um, can look very beautifully silvery, such as in this picture here. And when a human being pours it over their hands, that's what it looks like. And that really is happening um, in cer certain places where people are trying to extract gold. And I'll mention about this a little bit in a, in a second, um, but you can see it's pouring uh, through their hands because mercury is a liquid uh, in the liquid form in room temperature. In the past, people have also mined mercury for its beautiful color, which used to be added to paint. This is no longer really practiced, as far as I know, but this is also how it could be um, looking in a specific um, chemical form, in mineral form. So where can we find mercury? Uh, we find it in different types of um, uh, products, and it has its presence in different chemical forms. For example, we have a form of elemental mercury. This is the silvery, beautiful liquid form. Um, and we can still, maybe some of us can remember the thermometers that were actually by, uh, used with aid of uh, mercury in, in, um, inside. Other kinds of equipment, such as thermostats, also have employed elemental mercury. We also know mercury in the form of mercuric ion. Um, this could be um, as a, a part of um, some salts used in batteries, for example. We have some other organomercuricals, uh, which are used in some of the pharmaceutical products. And what I am mostly studying is the form that is also organic, but we refer to it as a methyl mercury. Specifically, it's monomethyl mercury. There's another form of methylated mercury, which is dimethyl mercury. But what is special about methyl mercury, monomethyl mercury, is its ability to bioaccumulate in marine organisms and biomagnify. And we'll talk about what this means in a minute. So where you can find methyl mercury is primarily fish, shellfish, and all other marine life hence the pictures of the tuna and all these canned tunas. So why should we care about mercury? So it's a toxic metal. It's been known for a while now that it's a toxic metal. Mostly we know about it that it's um, attacking our nervous system, not just our human nervous system, but also in animals. And we know that it's actually lowering the IQ in children who have been exposed perhaps through the um, uh, inside of their mother's womb, who have been the mothers who have been eating a lot of fish, certain types of fish. We also know that heart diseases have been linked to um, elevated exposure to mercury, and and there are other kinds of health conditions which I'm not going to go through. These just exemplify the problem of mercury, which is really toxic. And right now, so in the past, there have been some industries which were releasing, unfortunately, as a byproduct, methylmercury into the environment. But right now, this is all banned. And right now, our primary source of mercury uh, exposure to humans is coming through the consumption of, of fish. But that methylmercury that actually accumulates in fish is not something that was released by people, but it's something that is transformed from the inorganic mercury by bacteria that are living in the seawater and the marine mud, and is then taken up into the marine food web. Okay? How do we know that mercury is bad for you? This is a very unfortunate one of uh, several stories. This is the most famous one. It's, it's based on events that happened really in Japan in the 50s. Over 50s um, and 60s, people have learned about um, this condition, which now we refer to as a Minamata disease. It's, um, it's about a place in Japan where there was a factory. It was a chemical plant which has been dumping methylated mercury right into the bay. Of course, in Japan, people rely heavily on fish. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, that's really all you eat with some rice. And so people who have been fishing and, and eating that locally caught fish uh, their children started developing these horrible symptoms that were caused by this um, uh, poisoning. And this is a picture up here, just sort of a symbol. If you ever uh, Google Minamata disease, this will be one of the classic images that you will find, okay? And it just represents the horror that these people have to, had to live with, many victims. 
And right now I have to tell you that something I'm looking forward to is a new movie that's actually coming out in September this year, even with Johnny Depp, that's Johnny Depp, believe it or not, which is actually going to be describing the whole story of the uh, mercury, methyl mercury poisoning in Japan in Minamata. And something to look forward to. Um, so where is it coming from? So before people ever set foot on our planet Earth, mercury was there. There's so many other metals, right? And so it's coming from volcanism. And right now, whenever there's a, a wildfire, forest fire, some of the mercury is emitted back into the atmosphere and will de- eventually become deposited again on Earth, whether it's land or the ocean, and it again re-enters the natural cycle of, um, of its existence. We have many anthropogenic sources of mercury. That means people have perturbed the system and people have mined mercury from soils, from Earth, Somehow they have used it in what one or another kind of industry or application, and somehow that mercury was released back into the environment, creating some kind of pollution. It can be local, and it could be global. So I'm listing here some of these sources um, that are due to our human activity. For example, chloralkali plants. We are also releasing a lot of mercury when we're mining for silver or um, gold, um, large scale. Artisanal and small scale gold mining, this item number three, um, which could be abbreviated ASGM, is actually a quite a big source of mercury in our global atmosphere. It can account for 20%. And I'm not going to talk so much about that today, but I do want to just mention that these activities are really small. These are activities happen to be in South American countries, some of the African countries, and even Asian countries. And not that long ago, it was happening here in the U.S. on the West Coast when we had the gold rush. People were using mercury to extract gold. And in order for mercury to extract gold, you've got to mix up that elemental mercury with some soil. Mercury will be amalgamating, binding together with gold. To be able to separate the two, you have to heat it up. As you're heating this mixture, mercury is going to escape into the atmosphere while gold is going to stay behind. And that's how we get pure gold. Of course, as you're burning off all this mercury, it's it's getting right into the atmosphere, entering global cycle um, in the atmosphere. Eventually, it's going to be raining somewhere else out. Okay? And in the past, we had this source here in the U.S., but right now, we continue having this source of pollution through all these very small activities. There are people um, who are literally relying on their income for the fact that they are able to actually use um, ele- you know, elemental mercury and extract gold to be able just to support their families. And it's something that a lot of organizations are trying to battle. Okay, so we also see mercury applications in some paints, um, in light bulbs. I don't know how many of you have ever exchanged a fluorescent light bulb, but pay attention to what's inside you might find that there's some mercury in there. Make sure you go to Home Depot or Lowe's. I think they both will take those light bulbs and recycle it for you. Please do not put it in the regular garbage. Other kinds of equipment, such as uh, thermostats, barometers. And in the past, people have been using mercury in dental fillings, which was also quite a bit uh, in terms of pollution. So in medical waste, you had some mercury traces uh, right there in that effluent. Of course, fungicides, something that is le- a little known. If you enjoy the fireworks, well, there's also a little bit of mercury pollution there too. And of course, munitions, some of the munitions used by military, um, probably quite a bit of it was released during the World War II. Um, it's still legacy remaining in the environment. And the weirdest thing is that in some cultures, weirdest, I'm not being judgmental here, but in, in some cultures, Um, So ritual cultural products. In some cultures, people literally take elemental mercury 
and sprinkle it on their carpets because they think they're going to repel the bad ghosts. And so without knowledge about the properties of mercury, unfortunately they're exposing themselves and their children to the toxic fumes of this um, horrible metal. This picture is just illustrating to you again um, how mercury is moving through our ecosystem. So again, we have geogenic, so natural processes that are leading to its release into the atmosphere, so volcano eruptions. We have, of course, those fires, as well as our human activities or industrial activities. We know that coal burning is probably right now the largest of all these sources in terms of human activities because mercury is enriched in coal. And what happens then is once it's in the atmosphere and cycles globally, it will be deposited with rain onto land as well as the ocean surface, entering its cycle in the marine ecosystem. Some of it will be back, uh, getting back into the atmosphere, and it's up here you have a net HD0 evasion. In the surface ocean, it cycles. Some of it is going to be taken up by the biota, and some of, some of it is going to just remain in the seawater. Rivers are also a, uh, a source of a mercury into the coastal ocean, and actually I will speak a lot about it today. We also now know that there is a small fraction, likely, that's actually coming from underwater volcanoes. It's something that's brand new knowledge. It's not yet fully published, something I'm also working on, but due to time limitation, I'm not going to really discuss this today. So what's the fascinating thing about mercury is that we, through our activities as humans, we tripled the amount of mercury in the environment. These, this figure here is showing you estimates of mercury plaxes I'm not going to get into the details, but based on these various locations, people have taken cores of soil and measured how much mercury was there prior to our industrialization and how much was it after the industrialization, you know, took its life. And we are finding out roughly that we have tripled the amount of mercury in our global pool in those various locations. So now we know how much we added. Okay. So this is a description as a picture, as a cartoon, of how what happens to mercury after it's being released into the environment, whether it is coming from a smokestack of some coal-firing power plant or a volca volcano eruption. It goes into the atmosphere and it gets into the ocean somehow. In the ocean, it could be turned from inorganic form of it into monomethylmercury by bacteria. Once it's methylated and in that methylmercury format, it enters the food, food chain, or the food web, more correctly, I would say. So it could be taken up by phytoplankton, which are then eaten by zooplankton, which are then eaten by smaller fish, larger fish, and so on and so forth birds, people, we are part of this ecosystem. This is a simplified sort of a schematic of this process. <coughs> Seawater, of course, contains a lot of this methylmercury, and then phytoplankton are literally like a little sponges. They are quite efficient at taking it up from seawater. In fact, this is the biggest bioconcentrating mechanism from seawater into the food web, okay? So we have sometimes up to a million times more in phytoplankton in cer under cer certain conditions than it was in the seawater. And every other step in the food web is still bioconcentrating and biomagnifying. So biomagnification is referring to the process in which the predator is actually having higher concentration than its prey. That means the contaminant, in this case methylmercury, is building up okay, over the f uh, food cascade. So every step here you can see that just maybe two to five or two times higher concentrations you can find in these predators in relationship to their prey. And so the phytoplankton is really the very absolute key step in its entrainment into the food web. By the way, 
Methylmercury in seawater is actually really low. So it's actually present in concentrations on the order of femtomolar. Does anyone know what femtomolar means? 10 to negative what? It's 10 to negative 15. It's so low. It's so low that it took decades for being able to actually reliably detect it. So it's so low, and yet, and yet it reaches such high concentrations in fish that it's actually a threat to human health. As I said, mercury is a fascinating element. So back to the story of Minamata Bay, because this is where I want to convince you that it's a problem. It's not a problem that I want you to worry about by not eating fish. Please don't. Fish is really healthy and great for you. Don't skip that fish in your, on your dinner plate. But what happened is something that we shouldn't forget. In Japan, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, as I told you before, the chemical plant was dumping quite a bit of methylmercury into the local bay. These maps here are taken from a study by Japanese scientists, and it's showing you where the Minamata Bay is. So it's on this Kyushu Island, which is south, and here it's uh, depicted um, right here by the symbol. And you can see that there was a, this chemical factory here, and it's right on the coast, coastal zone, right? Beautiful, a perfect recipe for a disaster, which happened. As you see here, in the 1960s, we have really, really high concentrations of total mercury, and total mercury is just simply a summation of all types of mercury for, forms, chemical forms. In marine life, we think it's typically mostly the methylmercury form, which is so effectively accumulating. So t determining total mercury is sufficient to inform larger picture of methylmercury. As you see here, and this is a logarithmic scale, probably normally people are not really used to seeing it, but it's really just shrank to be able to enable better visualization. You see basically that in the 60s we have very high levels in terms of total mercury in the shellfish from Minamata Bay, and later on they declined with a little bit of a bump here. So over time they declined because the, the chemical plant had to stop its operation and stop releasing that toxic waste. And later on, actually, they were, by lawsuits, forced to clean up. So by ships, they had to go out into this coastal sea and literally dredge out that polluted sediment. And so this, is, this really is a really high number. You can see for some places which are not directly impacted by this pollution, concentrations are really orders of magnitude lower. It's something that's more representative of what's supposed to be um, in shellfish. So it was really a lot. So again, this is to show you the relationship here in what you just saw in the previous slide, really high concentrations in shellfish, and what happened to the people who were living in that coastline and likely consuming shellfish and finfish is that they have also been exposed so highly, and one of the things that happens after you eat fish, the mercury that is um, in that fish is assimilated into your body, and eventually it's discarded through your hair and nails. Isn't that weird? But it's a, a cool way to get rid of your methylmercury, but also it's a cool, w cool thing to know if you want to see how much exposure there is in humans. You can just take a clipping and quickly measure how much there is. And you can see that in the 60s, people there, oh, this, was a, this is human brain, though. I should, I should have read my slide before. Um, so in the brain, in the brain, so what I said before is that mercury um, is neurotoxic. So basically it attacks your brain and it creates the dysfunction in it. So you can see too is that concentrations of brain tissues uh, from people who have been in that area were really, really high in the 1960s and 70s, but then they declined because, of course, uh, finally something, some action was taken and people have been able to eat you know, healthier uh, seafood for their diet. And so here I also just highlighted that in the late 50s, you have these kinds of concentrations, 108, 175 milligrams per kilogram or ppm. Sometimes people refer to it as uh, 60 ppm. And in the late 80s, 89, 
you have a decline in fish from only you know up to seven, which actually seven is still high, but you can see that over the three decades, the decline occurred of, of, uh, on the order of um, uh, magnitude, okay? So that, that's good. We know at least that when you cut off the supply, the system itself is getting cleaned up. Okay, so this is the hair story. <laughs> I got ahead of myself a little bit here. So this map, uh, while it contains quite a bit of information, um, and I hope that you can still distinguish, the, the, the big thing to take away from here is that here we have this factory, it was called the Chiso factory, and the Minamata Bay is right here, and this entire sea is really impacted by this pollution. So you can see people who have been eating fish have really high concentrations of mercury in their hair. These triangles are indicating cats which have been spotted by people, and these cats have developed these uh, symptoms of, of the disease. They basically started having convulsions and, and started moving in a way that kind of resembled dancing, and therefore this disease was initially called as a uh, dancing cat disease. And so where people have been able to observe these cats, you also have these triangles. Also, there were massive fish kills. So pe people were basically observing fish, you know, floating on the surface of the sea. So all these things really are matching the whole concept of mercury pollution. And now, after decades since these events, we finally came globally to an agreement that mercury is, of, is a pollutant of global concern and that we have to combat it. We have to eliminate it or minimize it, its presence in our environment. And we really have a lot of different things that we can do. So countries have been signing off onto this document and really have made certain promises to be able to lower mercury use in our industrial applications. So maybe in your future, you no longer will be able to find that fluorescent bulb mercury in it and, and other types of equipment as well. So people really should be trying to work on alternatives that are eliminating mercury. So what do I research? I've, I'm trying to find out what are the major factors that are actually controlling concentration of methylmercury in seawater. Because what... What controls the, we need to find out what controls the concentrations of methylmercury in seawater in order for us to be able to actually predict how this methylmercury is going to be building up uh, through the food web. So it's very important to find out uh, what, what controls its concentration, both formation as well as its stability. And the number two is what are the significant processes that control its flow in the food webs? I live in Connecticut, um, hence my affiliation with the University of Connecticut. And so <clears throat> right in my backyard, I have a nice little sea, a uh, nice, nice sea, uh, which is uh, called Long Island Sound. And it's showing here. Whoops, that figure looks bizarre here in this uh, particular projection. But um, it's right here along the North Atlantic coastline. And so we are able to use it as our kind of laboratory. It's easy to go and sample from it. Before I get into Long Island Sound, I wanted to share with you some data that are actually from the North Atlantic. So interestingly, in the marine field, uh, the first people who got fascinated by the problem of mercury following the poisoning in Japan were oceanographers. And these were specifically chem chemists. And so what the oceanographers do is they, they skip, they skip the, the beach, they skip the, the little sea, and they go right into the middle of the ocean, okay? They don't want to bother with the little sea or a bay. So initially, people have really struggled figuring out how to measure methylmercury in seawater. It has, as I said before, extremely low concentrations, and it took decades to figure out how to do it. And I, am, I have this privilege of, of um, knowing the scientists who have who actually developed the methodology to, to reliably and cleanly measure concentrations of methylmercury. This is Professor William Fitzgerald. He is an emeritus now for many years, but actually still shows up for work um, occasionally. So he calls himself the best paid postdoc, actually. <laughs> He's 
fascinating figure. So he actually figured out how to measure methylmercury in seawater, and one of his academic grandkids, Caitlin Bowman, was brave enough to spend many months at sea and created this beautiful data that we now are able to plot and see how concentrations of mercury actually look like in the ocean. So this is a trans transect um, of uh, one of the cruises, so not cruises such as uh, Queen Mary or whatever other cruise ships, but these are scientific cruises. And what happened there was they took off from Portugal, went down the European and, and North American coastline, and then turned uh, towards the North, uh, uh, North American continent. And this is the transect of what it's look, looking like. So total mercury, so all the forms of mercury together combined are here plotted. This is what is just in the water that was filtered, eliminating all the particles, including bacteria. This is just what's left in seawater. And you can see some kind of different colors. So the warmer colors are going to show you where this concentration is higher. The colder colors are going to show you where it's lower. Okay? And what's fascinating here is that this area is actually representing um, hydrothermal vents. That's how we were able to find out that hydrothermal vents are releasing, among other metals, also mercury, something that we didn't know before. And here on the, on the bottom pa panel here, you can see particulates, so whatever the particles that were actually removed from the water um, uh, while filtering were captured and then analyzed. And you can see the same thing. You can, you can see that you have elevated concentrations of um, total mercury on the particles and a little bit elevated concentrations here. This is by um, probably Massachusetts Woods Hole, so in Cape Cod. And why that is the case, I'm not really quite sure. Possibly because of the mud being resuspended there and mud has um, higher concentrations. How is it looking for methyl mercury? So that part that actually accumulates in fish. Um, it's a mess, a total mess. Um, you see a little bit of it here by the hydrothermal venting systems, but really it's really difficult to understand what's going on here. And in particular uh, form, we see that on particles we, we see higher concentrations here by Europe. And that's possibly because of a, a flux from the Mediterranean Sea. But so little is known in terms of what actually is driving the formation of this chemical compound. We have so much to discover still. And so to be able to actually determine what, how to interpret the patterns of these concentrations, we are really scratching our heads and have no idea. So here I come back to my little Long Island Sound, which is drawn here. So this is Long Island. And this is Connecticut, and this is also here in New York. And so this body of water is what our backyard laboratory is. And we're going to be studying what's happening here. We had an opportunity to join a cruise that was led by our colleagues from my institute, and they were trying to characterize the fluxes of nutrients. So I've heard that one of the speakers here is actually going to be talking about nutrients and the nutrient pollution. So that's what my colleagues were doing on this cruise. But we were opportunistic, and we asked if we could join and study mercury fluxes as well. And they said, of course. So we were able to see how things are looking in terms of changes according to the tides. So in estuaries, you will have uh, fresh water from rivers mixing with the ocean water, and therefore there's a salinity gradient in estuary, okay? So whatever their constituents are carried through the rivers into the sea, are meeting the constituents that are brought by the ocean. And we wanted to see whether anything is happening to the mercury cycle due to this interaction. And I should mention that the cruise was set up to sample from, these, from this transect. So this is, it's happening some, something like that, like right here. Okay? So the water is rushing from the ocean into Long Island Sound, and it's emptying again. Uh, during the low tide event uh, into the North Atlantic again. So this is a lot, and I really don't expect you to pay attention to any particular thing. What these plots are, are specifically plotted uh, patterns for total mercury, again, all the mercury forms together, which are in the filtered water, so the void of particles, as well as on particles, 
We also have methylmercury, so the biocumulative form, um, in, in just seawater as well as on particles. But one thing I want you to pay attention to is just the changes in patterns. And these are really roughly changes that are happening, that are observed um, due to tides. So just the tide or season really can impact the distribution of these various mercury forms. So seasons matter, the tidal phase matters. Things are really dynamic in the estuary. So think about it uh, from the slide only about that tides matter and that seasons matter in terms of driving um, these different patterns in, in the estuary. We had uh, cruises in May, August, and November. That's why I'm referring to the seasons. We try to figure out what would it be that actually is controlling the formation of methylmercury in seawater. By the way, in the past, people thought that all the methylmercury was formed just in mud by uh, bacteria which can live in, ox uh, in areas of mud that are completely void of oxygen. Right now, this knowledge is no longer valid because we now know this, this information is no longer valid because we have new information which is allowing us to to determine that actually this, the formation of methylmercury is also occurring in water, which is fully oxygenated. So we don't really quite understand how it's happening, but that's something that we're trying to work out. So what we found is that, in fact, during high tide, we have a lot more production of methylated mercury. During the, during the low tide, things are a little bit more mixed up. And really the most interesting part of it is that we have a lot of production just by the Connecticut River. So Connecticut River is where we have one of the stations. So the S1 here, the symbol, this is where the Connecticut River is coming into Long Island Sound, and it's mixing with the ocean water. So we have the red colors again there. It's because we have formation of methylated mercury. And you see here that this is also depicted here. We have higher concentrations of the dissolved methylmercury during high tide in comparison to the low tide. So how is this happening? We think that as river is coming into the sound, into Long Island Sound, it's bringing a lot of mercury on particles. So think about it as just any kind of mud that's resuspended, all the debris. Right now we have still some snow here, but eventually all the snow is going to be melting and going down with the rivers, and eventually it's going to make it to some kind of sea. It might be Long Island Sound, it might be North Atlantic, it might be some other bay um, before it enters uh, uh, fully, you know, North Atlantic Ocean. But all this, uh, all this stuff that's carried out, some of it is actually having a mercury. As this mercury is delivered into the sea, it's interacting with the constituents that are brought by the tide from the ocean. And what we think ocean supplies is speci special kind of microbial community. Some of that community is actually able to methylate inorganic mercury that is delivered by the rivers. And so this is the, sort of the picture of it, that we have the particles with mercury and we have the heterotrophic microbes, so basically uh, these bacteria that are now working together. And now we have decomposition of the organic matter, because that's what bacteria like to do. And as one of the sort of end effects, we have also production of methylated mercury. And so uh, that's what we think is happening. By the way, this picture here is just uh, showing you what all the, the matter that's suspended in the water, it's called marine snow, looks like. It's just sort of this amorphous goo um, that's suspended in the water, but that's where we think the bacteria live. So it's kind of like little towns, little cities, uh, very diverse, and all these microbial processes are going on there, and we think that's where the methylation of mercury is occurring. We also know, it's interesting what we are finding, that bacterial communities change over the seasons. A former student from my department had <clears throat> evaluated the composition of microbial community, showing that sulfate-reducing uh, sulfate bacteria, which is a major group, that's capable of methylating, bacteria, uh, methylating inorganic mercury is really changing over the course of these months. Note that in green, we have very few of them in March. So right now, few of these bugs are in the seawater. But as the seasons are changing, July is the yellow color, September is the orange, 
and November is in these darker, sort of brownish color, we see that this community of these sulfate-reducing bacteria is actually increasing. Therefore, perhaps seasonal differences are really important in terms of looking at the production of methylated mercury. Something that we didn't realize before could be a, a factor. This is too uh, complicated, I realize now. I should have uh, thought a little bit better about my audience today, so apologies. But a student who was working with me on this project did this fancy modeling. All to say is that, in all likelihood, it's this heterotrophic microbial community that's really driving the production of methylated mercury. That's all I wanted to, to leave you with. And we have some indication that phosphate production kind of correlating with methyl mercury production. Phosphate production in seawater is resulting from the degradation of organic matter. So we have, uh, for, for example, leaves decomposing or grasses or any other kind of organic mass, biomass, and bacteria are decomposing it, you will observe increase in this phosphate concentration in that seawater. And coincidentally, we think methyl mercury as well. So let's move to bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation in critters is driven by so many different factors, and this is sort of just a simplified um, uh, picture of how I think things are working. We have some evolutionary processes that are you know, influencing uh, how animals work, what their physiology is like, um, and so on and so forth. So here we have genetically based growth capacities. Growth is something that's really influencing the amount of bioaccumulation that occurs in organisms. We also have the, the food web structure matters. So any kind of shift, ecological shifts in food web in the ocean or in freshwater ecosystems is going to be changing the way mercury is accumulating as well. Um, so the feed, so basically feeding then is directly connected to it. And of course feeding is very much controlling the, the, the growth of organisms. So organisms that are eating less will grow less the organisms that are eating more will be able to grow more. And that, again, is going to be influencing the amount of methylmercury that's going to be accumulating. Temperature, again, temperature is associated with your geographic position. Whether you live in north or south, it's going to matter. Um, and, of course, we have climate change ongoing. And so there are some outstanding questions about how climate change is going to be influencing various chemical cycles, including accumulation of toxic chemicals such as methylmercury. So how are things looking in our marine fish? This picture is showing you predatory fish species, just two examples. To say that um, in the North, uh, in Atlantic bluefin tunas, which you find in the North Atlantic Ocean, um, you have this general pattern, which a lot of people are already aware of, that as the fish are getting larger and older, uh, you will expect to see higher concentrations of methylmercury in their, in their uh, muscle tissue. And what is terrible about this slide is that you cannot see the data at all on this tiny dogfish. But please take my word for it to, to believe me that the same pattern is occurring here in spiny dogfish. It's, a, it's another predatory fish, which I just wanted to show for comparison. And it's just showing increasing concentrations with the size of these fish. <coughs> and it's something I, I'm not able to show you the age pattern because spiny dogfish are impossible to age. There have been some attempts, but these methods are not reliable while we are able to better determine the ages of these tunas. So I spoke about geographic differences <clears throat> which can control concentration uh, or bioaccumulation mechanism of methylmercury in, in crit critters, marine critters. This study we did based on Atlantic silver site, which is a fish you can see in the background here. If you ever go to any of the Atlantic beaches, little bays uh, along the coast, if you see the silvery fish, it's very likely that these are the Atlantic silver sites. They're everywhere, and they're incredibly important in terms of supporting the coastal food web. So many different fish feed on it. I saw a study which said, that young bluefish, maybe 80% of their belly contents, of their stomach contents, were actually comprised of Atlantic silver sites. So they're very, very important 
They're also really interesting to use as a model because so much research has already been done and we know a lot about their biology and physiology and ecology. All this stuff is well known. So studying mercury on this fish is, is really fun. What is also special about these fish is that, as I said, they live in these various bays along the North Atlantic Ocean, this really huge gradient in terms of the temperature of the water. This figure here shows you during the year, during the year, how temperature of the water in these coastal bays changes. This is something like along, you know, North Flor northern Florida, South Carolina. You see that along the whole year, the water is really, really warm like pretty much all the time. And fish can grow there all the time. But as you're going north, and these fish occur uh, up to the Magdalen Islands in, in Canada, you see that the water is much, it's really cold most of the year, right? And so only for about 16 weeks out of the entire year, the, the water temperature is just warm enough for these fish to actually grow. And so how is this potentially influencing the concentrations of methylmercury, its accumulation. So what we did is we actually studied this, and we sampled silver sides from various bays along this thermal and seasonal gradient along North Atlantic coast, uh, coastline. And we have found out um, these dark dots are the adults, and they only actually live only for one year. Then they spawn and they will die. So we see actually that... Um, in this geographic range, from around the Chesapeake Bay until, I believe this is Newfoundland, uh, we see this increasing concentration of methylmercury in these fish. And it's actually contrary to what we expected, and we have some clues about why this is happening, but we actually would need to make experiments to determine whether this hypothesis is supported. So I don't want to speculate here, um, but just say we are observing geographic patterns of concentrations of methylmercury in these fish. We also looked at the juveniles, so they were roughly two months old, and this relationship was also somewhat evident, much less so. Um, so that's, that's really something to say that geography matters, where these fish are taken from matters. Perhaps you know, this should be further examined in some commercially important species, which are also their populations occur in a broader geographic range. Does, does it matter whether we eat fish from, you know, Massachusetts versus uh, caught somewhere in Chesapeake Bay? I wonder whether this is something that we should look at and, and whether it matters for managing human exposure or something I'd like to do in the future. So how are things looking uh, here? So I'm trying to paint you a picture of not just a little <clears throat> sea such as Long Island Sound, but how it's really connected to the ocean, uh, to the oceanic food web. So in Long Island Sound, in these tiny shallow coves and bays, most of the fish we find are these Atlantic silver sides, killifish and stuff like that, tiny fish. As you go into the depth of Long Island Sound, which is roughly 20, 30 meters deep, you'll find more fish which are more like the alewipes. And they're quite a bit bigger. What you see is that in Atlantic silver sides, the, the, the big ones, uh, concentrations are actually uh, can be higher, so much higher than what you find in any of these larger alewives. And then if you go to places such as Cape Cod, you will see that um, uh, so much of the food web is really dependent on these fish, which are the northern sandlands. If you ever like to go whale watching, to Cape Cod, you will find whales because they came to eat these guys. And all the seabirds, dolphins, and, and the larger whales, they're all there because of sandlands. So it's important to know what's in them to study further the, the food web. Okay? And so these sandlands also turn out to be relatively of low concentrations. These, these are the symbols that are, are showing you the, the concentrations of a methylated mercury in the in these fish's flesh. And what is what is the significance of that? Is that all these three different fish, these are just examples of course, are the diet of predatory fish such as bluefish. Now bluefish um, you can see that in the year zero, so the smaller fish on average have 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15,
but when they're at one plus, they're older fish, their concentrations are already increasing, showing you again the concept of with age and size, concentrations will increase. Now, these bluefish then become the victims, the prey to other predators, such as the spiny dogfish or the Atlantic bluefin tuna and many other predatory fish that are there. And again, if you see, I'm listing in red here, their concentrations, so the young ones, the young bluefins may have 1.6, so again, it's higher than in the bluefish. And when they're older, much older, their concentrations can be something like 11 and a half. And the spiny dogfish, on average, its concentration is 1.4, and it also shows quite a bit of a range because we have fish which represent a broader spectrum and size spectrum. But it's just to show you that if you go up the food web from these forage fishes to their predators, things are increased, concentrations increase, and this is this concept of methylmercury biomagnification. I also wanted to share with you something I've been thinking a lot about is that we, as I told you initially, people started measuring, uh, wondering about methylmercury in the open ocean. But I really would like to think of it as more of a, a conveyor belt, the continental, the continental to ocean conveyor belt of mercury. Because so much of the mercury that we have emitted into our environment is still kind of contained on land. And it's really just slowly trickling away with the rivers towards the coastal ocean. And as it is getting into the coastal ocean, it starts entering this food web. And so small fish, so as initially the phytoplankton will take it up, some zooplankton will consume the, uh, the phytoplankton in these shallow coastal bays. Then these small fish will come and eat the zooplankton. And as these organisms are getting larger, they will start moving away into deeper waters. You will never find a tuna or a big shark in a small bay. So you're safe if you want to go and swim there. But you'll never find these big fish there. They're more of the oceanic species, right? And so it's as these fish are growing, they're actually also moving away from the continent, and so is the mercury in their bodies. So it's kind of like we're moving that mercury from land into the open ocean. So one component that has been really, really largely under studies is the shellfish. Even though shellfish can become critical components of the marine food web, so many different animals rely on it. I don't know if you ever went to a beach or pulled into some kind of parking lot where seagulls are flying around and just occasionally drop a shell here and there. It could be a crab. It could be a, a hard clam. A lot of animals really rely on, on, on vivals for their diet. Yet we know so little about um, contaminant accumulation in, in these bivalves. And one of my PhD students is actually trying to tackle this, this uh, question of what is happening um, in these bivalves, how much are they accumulating, how fast are they accumulating, and so on and so forth. So this is Gunnar Hansen, uh, one of my students, and it's his uh, PhD dissertation to try to answer some of the questions. Again, here, this is the typical way we think about mercury. This is a pelagic issue, meaning it's all in the water column. So we typically think of its transfer from seawater to phytoplankton to uh, zooplankton. This is a picture of a, one of copepod species into small fish, which there are, then are eaten by some predators. This is tribas. But shellfish also rely on phytoplankton for their um, nutrition. And so shellfish are also taken in methylmercury, for example, as they are consuming the phytoplankton. And then that is getting entrained into the rest of the food web because a striper will come up, or a seabird for that matter, or us, and will eat the shellfish. So we want to know more. Again, this is just to show you that even though these Organisms are living in the mud, so this is sort of a, a cartoon. This, this layer is representing the mud, so they lay there in the mud. And uh, when there's a phytoplankton bloom or just normal level of phytoplankton, they have a great way to filter out phytoplankton out of the water as their food, right? And so that is how they're entraining um, 
nutrition from the water column and make it into their own tissues, into their bodies. So we refer to this concept as benthic pelagic coupling or benthopelagic coupling, concept that uh, is commonly known in the area of biological oceanography. And so the questions are, how is accumulation of mercury dependent on the size of, of bivalves and how it compares in fish? So also, yeah, how, how do these forms of mercury look like when we examine different sizes, okay? So we have several different species of shellfish, and we compare these patterns with the Atlantic silver sides just because we know more about the Atlantic silver side, and it's, it's a good uh, model uh, organism to compare with. Uh, so we're using northern quahogs, which we refer to very frequently as just clams. If you like to eat clam chowder, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, these rib mussels are the next sort of uh, model species that we look at. They are not used for human consumption, although I think some people have attempted, but they're kind of disgusting, I would say. They look pretty yellow um, inside, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare touching them. However, we think that some animals, some marine predators might be feeding on these, so it, it's really worth knowing how things are looking in them. And also, there are also oysters, which are very common in Long Island Sound in certain bays, so they're also an important part of the food web. And for some people, they are, of course, delicacy. I showed you before in these large fish like tuna or the sharks, although the data wasn't really visible, that <clears throat> methylmercury is increasing with uh, the size. And as you see here for, for fish, for these silver sites, that's exactly what's happening. You, you saw some of the data in the earlier slide. I also am showing you here that this really is related a lot to seasonal changes. So this, these fish are only living at the most one year. And if you sample them occasionally during the, the spring and summer, May, June, July, and September, you will notice that concentrations are changing. So they're actually increasing. There is a little bit of a larger spread in these concentrations, and that's because probably in this portion here, we already have the juveniles, which are containing very little mercury. So this is a mixture of a, a larger silver size as well as the little ones. So how are things looking on average for these various species? We actually see that total mercury in these various shellfish are pretty similar to each other for total mercury and really also for methylmercury. So just based on averages, they're pretty similar, okay? And they're a little bit lower than, on average, than the fish. Now, this is interesting because these fish live only for one year and these are multi-year species. This just shows you that shellfish accumulates much more slowly than fish. And they're also, it's also possibly because they are lower in the food web. So these, these guys are eating phytoplankton, but these guys are eating copepods, so that's already zooplankton, so that's one trophic level above. The other interesting thing that I wanted to sort of highlight is that typically for fish, we believe, and this is supported by our data, that for fish, um, mercury that's accumulated in their tissue is pretty much all in the form of methylated mercury, methylmercury. But it's not necessarily the case for shellfish. So there's a little bit more variability. Sometimes we find 20% of all the mercury, all the total mercury, it's only in the form of methylated mercury. And sometimes we find that it's 100. So it's really variable, and we don't really understand why. So that's something that we should examine in the future, um, but we don't really know. So this is just to show how things are looking between shellfish and fish. So what are the correlations, relationships with size? So as, as a proxy for size, we can use shell length or shell height. Um, and here for mercenaria, which is the hard clam, uh, you can see that there is a little bit, so there is very little to say about uh, how, it, how total mercury concentrations change with shell length. It's, it's mass of the data. But for the methylmercury, we are observing a small decline with size. So we remember for fish it was increasing with size, but for shellfish it's the opposite. So that's a really surprising and not something that we have seen in the past, in, in before. So this is new finding. 
Um, this is from one bay. We found the same exact pattern in another bay from Long Island Sound. So this is consistent across uh, different bays. There is really nothing to say about these other two species, rib mussels or oysters. There's really simply no correlation between methylmercury and shells. So essentially, no matter how big um, these are, their concentrations are pretty much similar. Okay, this is also to talk about, so once mercury gets into the water, eventually it's actually going to be settling down into the bottom, so into the mud. And so actually muds, so marine sediments, are thought of as the final repository of a lot of contaminants. And that's because they get glob, they glob onto the, the particles like phytoplankton or resuspended sediments in the water column, and eventually they get scavenged out. They basically just get snatched away from the water column and buried down into the mud. That's how they're being removed from the ecosystem. Remember I showed you uh, in the Minamata Bay um, over the course of years, the, the shellfish uh, concentrations of methylmercury were uh, declining. So even though initially they were really high, then they declined. That was likely due to the fact that not only there was no more supply, so the factory shut down its activity, but also eventually all the methylmercury that was in the water column got basically taken in by these particles in the water column and, and settled down. So that was just kind of removed naturally. So right now we know that um, elevated concentrations are there, but uh, in comparison to pre-industrial conditions, but what was it like in the past? And we have this study in New Haven Harbor where we saw, based on a core that was basically drilled in the salt marsh, we have a really high peak here. And that's related to the fact that we have a lot of industrial activities in the whole region of, in Connecticut as well as the whole New England, something that we all should be aware of. New England was super industrialized, right? And a lot of pollution was coming in um, into our watersheds. And so you can see this is, this is the perfect example of in the past. And unfortunately, we don't really know exactly but we believe this is roughly 50s, 1950s and 60s. was a lot of pollution coming in and sequestering in the score. Um, so something also, th this also was shown in a study that was done in Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island as just to show that <clears throat> uh, people have, who have actually been able to tell the age uh, inside the, the soil core or sediment core that was taken and analyzed for mercury and other pollutants, they see that in 1950s, Roughly, we have this elevation of uh, mercury pollution, um, also coincided with lead pollution um, in, the, in the same kind of a period of time. So that's all I wanted to say is that historically, we put a lot, and 80 times higher. I rem uh, if you remember, I said globally, on average, we tripled the amount of mercury, um, right? The amount of mercury globally is tripled. But in some cases, as we see here, Localized, uh, uh, localized kind of impacts could be such that we could increase it by like 80 or 100 fold in comparison to pre-industrial eras, which is quite remarkable, I would say. We wanted to see if New Haven Harbor is more polluted than other bays um, in Long Island Sound. Um, so we actually studied several different sites without, within the harbor and compared it with some other sites in Long Island Sound. Uh, looking at concentrations of methylmercury in Atlantic silver sites, we basically were using these silver sites as kind of bioindicators of pollution. What we are actually finding that within these sites in New Haven Harbor, they were all kind of similar with a couple of exceptions, but really similar. And what we found is kind of good news for people who live in New Haven, maybe fish there, um, is that the fish were actually less contaminated with methylmercury in comparison to these other bays Long Island Sound. So that was, that was interesting and kind of surprising a finding. What might that be, uh, what might be happening here? It might be that that old pollution from mercury that is getting into our estuary, our harbor, is actually not really available. It's not really biologically available. So even though this mercury is coming down through rivers, it might be in chemical form and geochemical form, really. So attached, the, this metal is attached to types of particles uh, which are not accessible for bacteria to process. 
So again, methylmercury is that form that is accumulating in food webs. But what if that, that methylated form couldn't be produced by a bacteria because that mercury was actually trapped by some mineral form um, on the particles that made it unavailable. So we think that's where maybe what's happening, although this needs to be further examined. Anyway, it's good news for the New Haveners. Um, again, looking at more surface sediment um, and within the sound, and it's actually quite a fascinating uh, story that I'll just touch on very uh, quickly. But one major thing to know is that if you go to places that have a lot of mud, you will have higher concentrations of mercury. The percent organic matter in the mud is directly correlated to the concentration of total mercury in the mud. It's just there's more surface area for the mercury to attach to. So if you have sandy bottoms, that's typically corresponding with much lower concentrations. It's important to know. And again, these are uh, this is sort of uh, the depiction of concentrations a surface, just the, the surface mud, if you scoop it, in these various bays, which are um, marked here on the map, you can see that only in the case of SC, which is actually Stratford, you have elevated concentrations because it was really, really muddy there. One thing that's fascinating about Long Island Sound is that we observe this pattern. You have, and this really should be flipped, but it's not my data, and my, not my figure, so it's, it's, you just have to reverse it in your head. So Western Long Island Sound typically has higher concentrations, and that's kind that's um, in the main basin. Um, these samples were taken of, uh, from the ship. If you examine the, the sediments from the, the surface of Long Island uh, surface sediments of Long Island Sound, you see that in Western Long Island Sound you have higher concentrations than in the central basin and that in the eastern end of Long Island Sound. Same thing goes for the methylated mercury, monomethyl mercury. And that is largely because of this. Because in the Western Island Sound, the sediments are muddier. So you have more mud on the bottom, and it actually can uh, take it, it can actually accumulate a lot more uh, mercury um, than in the case for um, sandy sediments. Another interesting here is that. In Danbury, Connecticut, right, he wanted me to talk about that, there was a huge hat making industry. It was like the world capital of hat making. And for that industry, there was a huge amount of mercury nitrate that was used to treat uh, the pelts of animals. And that created so much pollution in the region. Still River is a little small river that's flowing through Danbury, Connecticut, and along its shorelines were maybe something like 50 factories. And so all of these factories were dumping massive amounts of mercury, um, you know, into the environment. And, and while this was happening primarily in the 1800s, and it was, I think, maybe stopped in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, but we still have quite a bit of that legacy mercury remaining, and, and there's a PhD student at Wesleyan University whose a PhD dissertation is exactly focusing on this subject. Um, so I don't really have ability yet to speak about it, but um, I can tell you that um, there's quite a bit of, of that pollution in Danbury, Connecticut, and it is, uh, however, doesn't seem to be very actively cycling um, in the food web. But what happened there was that Still River was very polluted, and Still River is flowing directly into Housatonic River, and Housatonic River is draining directly into Long Island Sound. And so what was found is that that, that input from Housatonic River into Long Island Sound, is, you can exactly tell because that's where the highest concentration of mercury is found in the sediments in the bottom mud in Long Island Sound. So that pollution was definitely coming down from land towards the, the ocean. And so entire Long Island Sound right now, I believe, is still impacted from that time of this industry of hat making. So in Long Island Sound, what we have <clears throat> is really quite a bit higher concentrations in comparison to other regions. Some of my research is taking place in the Bering Sea as well, and I don't have the data to present for you today. But I wanted to tell you that the Bering Sea is so much cleaner 
<laughs> is because there was nothing like um, a heavy industry that was directly polluting uh, this ecosystem. So Long Island Sound, unfortunately, and other, uh, you know, Narragansett Bay, these places, unfortunately, are much more impacted because of our industri industrialization of this region um, in the past. I will skip this one. Um, so we, what we did is I was talking a lot about, <clears throat> you know, silver sites and the shellfish. Um, but we wanted to know, for people who are catching fish, you know, just going angling um, and then want, want to consume these fish for dinner, what, what is the impact on their health? We have uh, a sort of uh, understanding that uh, based on U.S., uh, EPA, uh, uh, sort of uh, a number that they provide as far as the reference um, a dose. We know that we should not be eating fish which have uh, higher concentrations than 0.3 milligram per kilogram in the, in the fish meat. Based on this, we calculated how many fish meals people can have um, if they specifically <clears throat> consume Long Island sound caught fish. And this, this, these calculations are based on the concentrations we have measured for these different fish. And so we've, we find that typically, of course, children are the smallest. So the reference dose is calculated uh, based on our body mass. So people who are larger, um, they can have, a, you know, greater uh, servings of, of uh, fish and they can eat it more frequently. But children are specifically more vulnerable because of their small body size, body mass. So children really shouldn't be eating more than, say, uh, one or three meals per week. Now, it's probably not really common that children are, or any, anybody is really eating every day fish from Long Island Sound, but this is, just a, this is just a calculation that we did to sort of figure out what would, be, what would it be like. So if, if you are someone who is, uh, you know, catching a fish from Long Island Sound for your meal every day, well, you know, maybe really you shouldn't be eating that, uh, that fish um, every day. So we, we just kind of came up with uh, some kind of advisor, advice um, for a uh, number of meals. So in conclusion, um, we know that production of methylmercury, which is this um, bioaccumulative form of mercury in marine ecosystems, is really... Um, happening at the intersection of the rivers and the ocean. And we think it's stimulated by the marine bacteria, while the inorganic mercury is coming with, uh, uh, through rivers, with rivers, uh, I mean, it's attached on these particles. We also know that concentrations of methylmercury, we saw that in fish, it's proportional to the size of the animal. But it doesn't have to be. For shellfish, it could decline, right? We saw it for clams. Um, methylmercury is inversely related to the size of the animal. So um, something that we didn't realize before, and it's something that people who are uh, modeling um, the flow of methylmercury in marine food webs, they can incorporate now this information into their models to kind of understand um, in a larger scale how methylmercury is moving in the marine food web. And also we know now that the legacy mercury pollution um, is there. It's been trapped by these muds, by, by these sediments. Uh, and we can see, we can calculate how much uh, we've added into this particular ecosystem there. So um, we do know, too, that um, since the, uh, maybe, uh, since the, the industrial activities declined again, we see declining amounts of uh, mercury in these surface sediments right now as there's no new input coming in. But there's still a lot of um, mercury in our environment, so it's just slowly trickling from um, the entire watershed, watershed to the ocean. So it's just still, uh, it's going to be coming down for decades, if not centuries. Um, probably um, there isn't a really year in sight uh, by which we will re reach out again, re reach um, some kind of pre-industrial um, concentrations anymore. And that's because we still burn coal. Um, we still are using a lot of these mercury-containing products um, and stuff like that. So until we don't cut off 
um, you know, fossil fuel dependency, mercury is not going to go anywhere. Okay? So that's one additional argument, I would say, to try to eliminate fossil fuels from, um, from use for energy generation. Um, so also, um, if you are someone who likes to rely on your locally caught fish, and if it's in a New England type of estuary, uh, this fish is from New England type of estuary, um, consumption is, of course, okay, but with moderation, um, and especially this is significant for children. So with that, I can just say thank you for your attention. I'm happy.